Hello, I'd like to welcome everyone to the PartSource Executive Webinar Series. Today's presentation, Practical Application of the CMS COVID-19 Waiver, is being presented by Matt Dummert and Matt Van Donzel, and hosted by Mara Pare and Frank Painter. Before we begin, I'd like to be, uh, review a few housekeeping items. First, you have a control panel at the side um, or top of your screen. You can minimize and expand this panel. Second, you can submit questions using the question portion of the control panel. We will answer questions at the end of the presentation. If for, for some reason your question is not answered, we will respond to you individually after the event via email. Um, and last, after the webinar, all registrants will receive a link to the recording of the presentation. This information will be sent via a thank you email and link to the email address with which you registered for this webinar. And now please allow me to introduce Mara Pare, PartSource's Vice President of Client Solutions. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Mara Perret, and I have the honor of introducing our presenters and my co-host, Frank Painter. At PartSource, we're working with our clients to enable them and our industry peers to overcome challenges, including challenges in times of adversity. We believe our client partnerships grow stronger after navigating such challenges together. PartSource is committed to being there for our valued customers throughout this pandemic and beyond. And as part of that today, I am pleased to introduce two HTM leaders and PartSource Pro community members who will share their story of navigating the COVID-19 pandemic and their practical application of the CMS COVID-19 emergency waiver. Matt Dummert has been part of the HTM industry for nearly two decades in leadership roles with third-party and in-house equipment management programs. Matt holds a bachelor's in electrical engineering and a master's in healthcare technologies management. Matt is also a certified healthcare technology manager, serves on the editorial board for Amy's BINT magazine, is a volunteer CBET program evaluator, and participates on the Amy Educators Committee. Matt is currently the HTM Director for Freighter and the Medical College of Wisconsin and is an adjunct faculty member for IUPUI as well as Marquette University. We're also happy to have Matt Van Dozel with us today. Matt is a clinical engineer at Alina Health, a not-for-profit network of 12 hospitals and 65 clinics. Alina's clinical engineering team consists of 80 technicians and supports over 140,000 devices. Matt has been in the healthcare industry for over 10 years, holds a BS in physics from Hamden, Sydney College, and is a CBET. Matt spent five years with a medical device manufacturer as both a manufacturing engineer and project manager, managing capital equipment installations across the globe. He joined Alina Health in 2017 to develop an in-house engineering program. Matt was recently been appointed to the Amy Medical Equipment Management Committee. Also joining us for the Q&A portion of today's webinar is industry expert Frank Painter. Frank is a professor and the Clinical Engineering Program Director in the Biomedical Engineering Graduate Program at the University of Connecticut. He is nationally and internationally recognized in the field of clinical engineering with over 45 years of clinical engineering and biomedical equipment service management experience. And with that, I'd like to pass it over to Matt Dummert to begin our webinar. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining the webinar. I think this is a very important topic that is very pertinent and uh, very timely. Um, I, I will say I'm going to share an experience from uh, basically the way that I've experienced the situation, recognizing that this is just one experience and there is a lot of variability out in the field and, and hopefully you'll be able to take bits and pieces out of this to, um, to apply to yourselves or, or learn from it or just to, conti to continue the discussion. So I'm going to start off by um, 
just kind of starting at the beginning, I guess that's a good place to start. Um, before March, we were staffed at Freighter and the Medical College of Wisconsin for normal operating conditions. So we at Freighter, we have three hospitals and a few dozen clinics and outpatient centers. Um, we uh, have a, a large academic medical center and then the two community hospitals were in the process of building a couple of other considered micro hospitals. Um, so that was kind of our normal world. We had we had a regular repair request coming in. We had our, our normal P PM process and we had a number of projects. Um, our organization is growing uh, very rapidly. We are not only building uh, new facilities to accommodate our patient loads, but we're also expanding and renovating our current facilities. So our world as we know it um, was was crazy as it was, and and we were staffed in order to, to kind of manage through that normal condition. Now on the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit more pertinent to the discussion around um, the CMS waiver is our, our normal condition under um, you know, pre pre COVID, I would say, uh, was the whole 100% managed PMs, and this would look very familiar to everybody. So it almost doesn't need to be said, but I just want to make sure we're all starting at the beginning. Um, when we're doing our PMs, we are either completing the PM, or possibly we have a could not locate situation, and we have various policies and procedures on how to follow up with those. We have equipment not available as an option, and we have ways of dealing with that if the equipment's on a patient or if the, the equipment's out for repair. So we have kind of all these, um, these scenarios that we've grown to be comfortable with and accustomed to. Um, I distinctly remember, uh, it was probably March 12th, uh, which was a Thursday, uh, I was off for the day and my wife and I were shopping for furniture in Ikea. Um, and we got a message that our kids were going to be coming home from school and they were going to be staying home from school for at least six weeks. Uh, it also became apparent to us that this was going to happen. And oh, by the way, their primary caretakers when my wife and I are working are the grandparents who are in high risk category related to COVID. So we have to think of how we're gonna manage through this. So we kind of hit this internal panic button, this personal panic button. So on the next slide, let's kind of look at this from the perspective of our work environments. Now, I share my personal experience of my, my panic button because, uh, not because it's any different than what anyone else was going through, but we need to recognize that this wasn't just a work environment condition. This was something that expanded beyond our normal work, work environment. And people were dealing with a lot of real personal issues around this. So we had to manage through that as well as manage through our medical equipment program. So we're, we're, we're working through our normal workload, which we were staffed for. But now all of a sudden we have hundreds and hundreds of new pieces of equipment that are being shipped to us that we had um, purchased in order to prepare for the COVID um, potential surge. We're converting um, ICUs, uh, acute care units into ICUs and, and shifting beds around, trying to figure out where are we gonna put the COVID patients, where are we gonna put the, uh, uh, the non-COVID patients. We're moving equipment throughout the organization. On top of that, we have our, our, we're dealing with our staffing, trying to figure out their personal situations and how we can manage through um, dealing with all the issues that we have in our workplace as well as the personal situations. We're trying to separate our staffing so that they're isolated from each other. Um, because if one person gets sick, it could knock out our entire department. So really all this is going on, and, and I say panic button, not in the sense that we were running around really freaking out, uh, although it, sometimes maybe it felt that way, but we just, um, we needed to prioritize. And what we did is we decided that it is not an option for us to not be overly prepared for the worst case scenario. Um, we needed to put all of our resources and efforts into preparing for a COVID surge. 
And because of that, we made the decision very early on within a few days of when the stall was kind of kicking in that we were going to defer our PMs and, and focus on COVID related activities. Now this was done when we thought maybe this was a, a deferment for a couple weeks. We did not anticipate where this was going. This was more of a kind of a gut reaction, but it was not an option for us to not be prepared. So moving to the next slide, um, we had, obviously we had critical PMs and we have non-critical PMs. Um, it, it, it worked out that we were able to actually keep up with our critical PMs through March and April. Uh, we had a lot going on. Um, it, was, it was a crazy time, but we were able to keep up with our, our critical PMs, which was uh, very fortunate. Um, I know we were fortunate and not everybody is fortunate to have that capability in this time, uh, depending on the level of surge that you're experiencing. But for the non-critical uh, PMs, we, we did kind of recognize that, that we needed to keep track of what was going on with those PMs. Because we, we knew we had the could not locate, we knew we had the equipment not available, but we didn't want to necessarily say use equipment not available um, for the, the COVID related deferments because we wanted to keep that separate so that we could kind of um, keep, keep an eye on what the impact of the COVID situation was. So that's where we come into the, the waiver. Um, so I, 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 will, I will say I, I digested the COVID waiver in, in bits. Uh, I was kind of nibbling at it as it came out. Um, initially, it was just a little bit of a relief. Um, I really appreciate all those who had um, done the legwork in, into getting this uh, waiver to even be issued. Um, I was so engulfed in my own personal little world that, um, that I, I just appreciate the industry stepping up and, and kind of coming up with um, this, this solution or this interim solution for us. Um, and just taking kind of a quick uh, side, side step here, from an imaging perspective, our imaging team had a pretty decent amount of capacity. A lot of the areas that they support were either shut down because they're outpatient centers or they, um, the patient load just wasn't very high. So they had capacity. Although we were trying to restrict how often they were up in the clinical floors to um, reduce their potential exposure. Uh, so, and we also wanted to keep them available because they did help our general biomed staff as well through a lot of the times. But, we were able to keep up with our normal PM procedures with our imaging equipment and our critical PMs. Uh, the imaging, we fell behind a little bit, um, so we do have to do some catch up, but we feel like because there's capacity there, we're gonna be able to, to catch up with the, with the imaging PMs. Now, when the, for applying the waiver, the non-critical PMs is really where that's coming in for us in, in our situation. I mean, our initial intention was, okay, complete the PMs when you can. But as this dragged on, it became apparent to us that that was not going to be necessarily an easy task. We had really, there was a couple options. There was, there was um, if, we, if we focus on the PMs that we had deferred, well, then we're going to start to run out of time and we're not going to keep up with the PMs that are, are generating in the months to come or if we start shifting the PM schedules altogether, well, that also snowballs and we're shifting all the PMs into the future, which could also be tough to, to manage through with uh, the various um, uh, vendors that we work with as well. So what we decided to do is um, we decided to focus on uh, the, the current month and, and follow our normal PM um, process for the current month that we are in and then go back and try to figure out what we are doing as far as the COVID deferred items. Now, a lot of times um, when we think of deviating from uh, certain procedures around PMs, we're thinking AEM. And I think that's a great place to start. Um, there's a little bit of it. It's a little bit different scenario. It's the same kind of concept, but um, the way I like to think of it is 
I was trying to think of a scenario or a, a um, kind of a, an illustration. I think of it. So if my kids are riding their bikes and they are wearing a helmet, if they're riding around in the driveway and I see them uh, without their helmet on as a parent, I may kind of shrug it off and be like, you know what, they're just riding in the driveway. It's not a big deal. Now, if they want to go on a two mile bike ride to the nearest park, I'm probably less willing to compromise whether they wear a helmet or not. And I feel like that's the situation we're in right now. An AEM program is really that, that two mile bike ride to the park. That is, um, we want good data, we need um, good justification because we are setting a precedent for a long term or an indefinite kind of change to our PM procedures. Whereas in the COVID situation, we're looking at our kids riding around in the driveway with a hel without a helmet on. And we're trying to decide where are the risks there. <clears throat> so, the, so we are not going to necessarily have the big data because if we did, we'd already have it on an, an AEM. So we're trying to find where that threshold is. What is that risk criteria and how do we determine what's going to be um, that, uh, that threshold? So settling into May and June, we, as I mentioned, we resumed our normal PM program for May and now in, into June. Um, and then we're trying to catch up with the COVID deferred piece of it. Um, part of the criteria that we've been using um, or that we are using as we go through this is um, we're, we're looking obviously at the risk of the equipment. We're definitely looking at whether there are um, certain parts associated with filters or things that um, we may not want to let linger. Uh, we're looking at PM kits and what type of activities are associated with working on that equipment for that PM um, versus some equipment may just be verification checks. And could those verification checks be pushed off? Could they be modified or could they be deferred until the next PM schedule? And again, this is, this is our our, our catch-up. This isn't necessarily our, our long-term plan. So what we're doing is we're, we're in the process of going through these evaluations of what we have uh, under that COVID deferred status. And we're reviewing it with a, um, our, our managers and our, um, our technical leads, uh, as well as our staff. And we're trying to make these determinations as quick as possible so that things don't snowball and it doesn't get too far out. Uh, we're also connecting with our EOC and our, our, our safety committees to make sure that they're comfortable with our approach um, going forward. So we've kind of come to a temporary normal, and I should use that temporary as a, a loose term. Um, this takes us back to one of my first slides where I was showing that the 100% manage was the, you know, you either complete it, maybe you can't locate it, maybe it's equipment not available. And now we have this COVID dis deferred status. Um, really, it's temporary in the sense that hopefully we've peaked and we are tapering off, although we've had uh, kind of a, a, a bump up and then we went back down and, you know, it's kind of, it's a little bit fluid and I know a lot of people probably on this call, I mean, some of you haven't peaked at all yet. Some of you peaked um, and you're on the downswing. Some of you peaked and now you're peaking again. Um, so you may be at various stages of this, but for us, we've created this deferred status and we don't know necessarily, are we, um, is the dust settling for us or are we gonna surge again? Or maybe we surge again in the fall but we have this tool, this COVID deferred process that we can define and help us through that, um, which also could be applied through other pandemics. Maybe other things are gonna come in the future or maybe even local, local disasters or local uh, emergencies. It's that same concept that we could apply. We might just change the terminology on it. So the last um, piece I just wanted to, to leave you with is kind of a food for thought. Um, a few days ago uh, at my house, I heard the tornado sirens go off and that means there's a tornado warning. So I took my kids and we all grabbed all of our stuff and my, my wife got some snacks. We all went down into our little designated tornado shelter in our basement, 
turned out it was a few miles north of us, so we weren't in any immediate risk. But it's amazing. You can think of a, a, a plan for a situation like that. But until you actually go through where you actually feel like you are in that or you are actually in that situation, you really learn a lot about how things work. I mean, we always thought, okay, we're going to bring the cat down. We're going to bring the dog down. We're going to grab the kid's stuffed animals and we're going to bring a snack. Well, we never really thought through what if we can't find the cat? Or what if the dog doesn't want to follow us down the steps? Until you're in that situation, you don't necessarily learn those lessons. So I think we've learned a lot being in this um, current state and, and we will continue to learn a lot. And really, I think everyone should feel okay that you weren't absolutely prepared for everything because you couldn't be. Um, but I think it's not okay if you don't learn something from what we've gone through. And I think one thing that um, kind of pops out a little bit is from, a, from this waiver perspective is maybe that we need to consider a concept of not only having a normal AEM program, but we may need to define what is a pandemic or an emergency kind of AEM program. Where, where are there certain thresholds where we might have to hit that panic button and make some deviations and maybe we can be a little bit more thoughtful about that so we're not doing it in the heat of the moment like we did now. So with that, I'll pass it on to Matt to uh, carry on the conversation. Thanks, Matt. Um, so yeah, first I'd like to thank everybody for joining the call um, and thank you to PartSource for giving me the opportunity to share my story and, and thank you to Matt for sharing your story. It's uh, you know, it's important for everyone to kind of feel that we're all in the same boat, even though it may be a slightly different size boat, right? Uh, we're all going through the same thing. And I hope that um, by me sharing my experience and some of my ideas, um, it'll help everyone else kind of navigate your own similar but uh, different situations as we deal with the pandemic. So um, I'll start off by talking about some of the challenges we've had, because I think we've probably all had some pretty similar challenges Um, certainly, uh, when we were first hit with the information coming out of, you know, China and seeing what's happening in Italy, Washington state, I think everyone had the same idea, like, well, we better, uh, order a bunch of parts and we better order a bunch of ventilators, equipment. Um, you know, we better make sure that our vendors are able to continue to support us. And so when everybody across the country and across the world starts doing that, of course we had issues. Um, longer lead times, orders that we thought we would get in a couple of weeks. It turns out, you know, we get a, a pretty vague ETA, right? Well, it could be six weeks, could be six months. We'll get to you as soon as we can. Um, and then, of course, we had the government uh, coming in to make their own purchases, kind of jumping in line sometimes. So we were pretty uneasy about that. Um, but that was certainly a challenge we had. Uh, for Alina, you know, we have 12 hospitals, uh, a, a whole load of clinics. And so trying to coordinate all of our hospitals with our corporate office, um, we have some departments like our clinical engineering department, we're a centralized department. So our entire structure flows up into the corporate office, but we're of course based in the hospitals and some hospitals have their own finance departments where there's a corporate component to that as well. And so coordinating all that effort uh, was a big challenge for us. So communication, um, I think probably everybody had some of that uh, of their own challenges around communication. And honestly, maybe the biggest part was just that everything is taking longer. Um, you know, we have restricted entrances to the hospital, so you have to walk a little bit further to get to a main entrance so you can get your temperature check. Uh, we have to don and doff PPE on a regular basis. Uh, we're trying to restrict um, technicians' exposure, potential exposure. So, we're not out doing rounds perhaps as much as we used to. Um, and of course, whenever you bring something into the shop to work on, you've got to make sure you clean it before you go much farther past the door. So everything is just kind of taking longer to accomplish. And pretty early on, it's easy to forecast and say, man, it's going to be really hard for us to keep up with our PMs and get ready for this pandemic uh, when it just you know takes twice as long to to go out and pick up a pump to come back and repair it. Um, and then just to kind of add on to our special situation, um, of course, in Minneapolis at the beginning of the month, we had a situation with George Floyd, which was terrible. And 
our our main hospital as well as our corporate office and our main warehouse were located right smack dab in the middle of that. So um, we had a fair amount of rioting and looting and arson right near our main warehouse, which happens to be where we've been trying to stockpile a lot of our PPE, extra parts, extra equipment. Um, and so to try to mitigate that, you know, we kind of scattered all of that uh, equipment and, and supplies to other locations, so we didn't have one big central target, right? So just one more thing to add to the complexity for us. Um, hopefully nobody else is having to deal with that too much. So definitely a lot of different challenges. Um, and so that, you know, really forced us to make some adjustments. The very first one uh, that we made is there was a huge surge preparedness effort that was kicked off. And I could probably spend the rest of the webinar explaining how we went through this, still going through this, um, and I won't be able to do it justice, but it's just the size and complexity. Um, but we each, we had each of our hospitals activate their HICS structure. Um, we had a corporate surge command stand up that tried to, um, well, tried to, we, we made a lot of different work streams so we could have experts concentrate on each one. So technology and medical equipment was a special work stream. Of course, I was mostly involved with that, but we also had staffing work streams um, just to try to figure out how, how much could we handle uh, when the surge comes. And so we're trying to, to make plans, you know, we're attempting to double our ICU capacity, right? We're trying to increase our general med surge slots or beds by 30 to 40%, increase our ED throughput, all while keeping everybody safe and trying to be good stewards of our financial resources. So long story short, this, this was a huge effort, took a whole lot of time. And fortunately we have a strong management and operations support team. So we didn't have to use a lot of technician time for this preparedness effort, but certainly, um, you know, we lost some productivity to that. Uh, at the same time, though, you know, we reduced across our organization a lot of regular meetings and other admin work. So if it wasn't critical, let's let's stop meeting about it. Um, we introduced, obviously, social distancing and remote work wherever possible. So, uh, you know, adding to the it takes longer to do everything aspect of, of work. Uh, we paused, thankfully, the vast majority of our projects. So we have tons of projects happening at any given time. And almost all of them, we just hit the pause button. The entire organization needed to focus on preparing for this surge. Um, and as we started resuming some projects, we're prioritizing things like integration so we can save clinicians time uh, during charting and documentation. Let's do that automatically rather than doing it manually. Uh, we kept going with some virtual tools projects like uh, rolling out Microsoft Teams so we could meet with each other and with our patients virtually to kind of reduce those face-to-face -face contacts where, where possible. And anything that was critical infrastructure, of course, we kept going with that. So if we were trying to change a, an empty department into an ICU and we needed to get in there to add med gas, those kinds of projects kept going. So we really were fortunate that we were able to pare things down to only the most critical things. Um, and when we look at our department in particular, we did not and have not yet uh, made changes to our medical equipment management plan. So we were very fortunate that, you know, we're, we're doing this work to support preparing for the surge. Our state was pretty effective at closing things down and flattening the curve as we were all talking about and probably still are. And so we were still able to complete all of our PMs. We're still 100% managed, I guess is the right word for it. So um, we're lucky we didn't have to change anything there. But at the very beginning of it, we did draft a, a new medical equipment man, management plan uh, policy to add to that, to talk about, okay, well, maybe we're gonna have to prioritize some things over doing PMs. And um, it was fortuitous, lucky, whatever you wanna call it, that at the end of last year, we as a clinical engineering department had already started working on some like risk and resiliency efforts to try to think about what are our critical services? What is it that we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis that's most important? What resources do we need to keep our operations going? Um, and just kind of like cutting away to the things that we absolutely could not do without in times of an emergency. And then suddenly here we are <laughs> presented with an emergency. So 
So in the next couple of slides, I'll talk about some of the basic ideas that we're, we're working into a policy that's kind of going through our management team right now. So when we talk about prioritizing PMs, um, we, we want this in its own policy uh, so that we can activate it only when there's a declared emergency. Um, you know, these are extenuating circumstances where we don't have parts, we don't have personnel. Um, it, it's just hard to get our work done because of an external situation. We don't need this to be in effect all the time. We don't want to misuse perhaps our ability to defer some things and eventually the we hope this uh, emergency will be declared over and then we'll have to be back to 100% managed uh, before the waiver came out. So we want it in a, a pretty modular kind of structure if we're gonna have a, a policy about this. Um, we want to certainly continue to complete all of our planned maintenance if at all possible. Obviously we need to prioritize, that's the key word here. Um, but when it comes to, you know, what are we here to do day after day, that's support safe patient care. And a lot of that is completing our plan maintenance to make sure that equipment is ready to go. Um, we are toying with the idea of a tiered response. So um, based on the level that we are affected by the emergency is how our department will operate. So a tiered one, two, or three, where tier one is, okay, we do have an emergency that has been declared by some entity, right? local federal government, perhaps our executive leadership has declared an emergency, but our department is operating pretty much as normal. And in those instances, we'll probably have more bandwidth to complete planned maintenance and tasks as usual. Uh, as we kind of move up into tier three, we have an emergency and our operations in particular are dramatically impacted. So we perhaps have shortages in staff or parts Maybe we have tons of corrective maintenance calls coming in because all of our equipment's being used more often. Um, so we kind of want to lay that out there. This kind of came organically right at the beginning of the surge preparedness effort, um, just kind of talking about as a, as a system, yes, we're in an emergency, but right now we have so many days of PPE still on hand, so we feel okay about that. Our inventory of supplies and medicine is good for several weeks, so we feel okay about that. So we were talking about this kind of like tiered response uh, across the system, and we thought it's probably a good idea just to write that down so everybody kind of um, can speak to what it means. And so one thing to think about is if you're going to go with this tiered response, we need to know how is whatever tier we're in, how is that recorded? Um, we need to think about how do we show when it changes, like when we go from a tier one to a tier two, um, what is that in a, do we bring that to the EOC meetings and say clinical engineering has gone to a tier two? Is it in a department meeting? We keep it in the minutes, it's in an email. So things to think about, if we have a policy about it, we need to find a way to make some documentation so we can show people later. Um, the next slide is kind of what Matt started talking about, maybe at the end of his story, like a pandemic specific AEM almost. Um, of course, there's not a whole lot of uh, hard data behind this, but when we think about our tiered response and we think about our risk levels um, of equipment, it kind of lends itself to a prioritization table. And so in, a, in an emergency, we're going to have some kind of an impact. And so even if we're at the lowest tier of response, maybe we don't prioritize our lowest risk PMs. Right, that seems like a sensible thing to do. It takes longer to do everything, so let's take the least risky equipment and we'll deprioritize that. Of course, noting that we're still gonna do the PMs if possible, but when it comes down to it, those will be the first things that we deprioritize. And so as you increase the effect of the emergency on your department, then you start to deprioritize riskier and riskier equipment. Um, I would say, you know, we have high risk and life support designations in our CMMS, and I know kind of technically they're the same, um, but you know, when it's when things go really bad and you need to make some difficult decisions, it might be a good idea to be able to say, yes, all this equipment is high risk, but we consider this life support equipment perhaps to be the highest priority when it comes to doing PMs. 
So, um, you know, the risk level thing, it's kind of imperfect. Um, but if we're thinking with common sense, this seems to be a justifiable way to handle it when we're in an emergency. Um, it's just one idea of kind of taking the thinking out of it because you might not have the time to really dig into each model or each category to say, are we going to do PMs on this or not? Let's just put it right out there at the beginning. We're tier one. We're just going to deprioritize our low risk PMs, but we're going to do them if we can. Uh, and, and also by going through this, it might, be easier for us to find a way to show which PMs were deferred, how how long they got deferred, um, and just kind of you know, figure out how to get caught back up and how we'll communicate about that. So it kind of feels like going through this exercise um, would help us document and communicate everything uh, that we needed to. So when we do get back to normal, um, we'll have a, a way a way back. And so. Next, you know, talking about returning to normal, um, you know, quote unquote, is it in purpose that on purpose there? Because I don't think we'll ever get back to the way things were exactly uh, before this happened. I mean, at least on our operational side, with remote work being introduced and virtual meetings, you know, it seems like that might be here to stay, at least in some form or another. So, um, <laughs> what our normal will be six months from now and, and 12 months from now and even six weeks from now could be totally different. It'll be interesting to see how it goes. Um, but when we do finally return to normal, um, our idea is that we'll have any of that maintenance that got deferred because we couldn't get to it. Um, we'll have that documented and we've got some ideas for perhaps adding special work order codes to our CMMS so that we can um, make a report on that and, and tell our EOC that these are the ones that we missed because we were dealing with the pandemic. Um, and since we know specifically which uh, maintenance activities we missed, we'll be able to make a plan to get back on track. And that would probably be something pretty commonsensical uh, when it comes to a plan, you know, prioritize highest to lowest risk and then oldest to newest, something like that. Uh, just something easy to communicate um, that to make sure we can catch up with all our maintenance. Uh, we'll have our projects and meetings start to slowly return. It's already happening. Our calendar is filling up again already. Um, so those those kinds of things will come back. And I think we'll need to kind of continue to assess, you know, what does our parts inventory look like? How many things do we actually want to keep on hand just in case? Um, our equipment levels, you know, we had some equipment kind of in the warehouse for emergencies, but certainly not a volume of equipment that would support our surge uh, as it was modeled at the beginning of the crisis. So maybe we need to think about how much equipment we just have and hold uh, and not use on a regular basis. And I think we'll also have to continue assessing our staffing and, and service models. So. Um, you know, remote work is part of that. Um, how many technicians does it take to do the same work in six months from now may not be the same as it did six months ago, just because everything takes longer. Um, and our service models, we have a lot of uh, our imaging and labs in particular, those groups are almost like a field service model. And then our other kind of in-house technicians, if you will, they're more traditional. They report to the same uh, site every day, and then they travel to, to clinics as needed. So is that still going to work for us? Uh, I think we'll have to do some more um, discussion about that. And so I think it's also important to kind of look back on what kind of lessons have we learned. Uh, we don't want to lose everything that, that we're going through right now, all this experience. Uh, my personal experience is that this has been a pretty good reminder um, for clinical engineering, for HTM, it feels like we're having our previous learnings validated here. And the best tools we had right at the onset was an accurate equipment inventory. I mean, that was super important. You talk about shifting equipment from places that maybe are closed down. If we close some clinics, maybe we need to borrow some of that equipment at a different site to, to open up some additional med surge bays. Um, accurate inventory was incredible, um, and it's also important so we know some maintenance trends. What are what are our commonly used parts? Matt talked about PM kits. Um, you know, sometimes a PM kit you might need that to make it repair, uh, and so we kind of need to know on a, on a regular basis how much stuff do we go through, 
And does it make sense to maybe start keeping some spares where we didn't before? And also our, our physical location, you know, we're kind of spotty on how we document the physical location of some of our inventory. Some things are super easy because they don't move. Um, other things we have real-time location systems tell us, you know, where things are. Um, but trying to find a way to make sure that we have a, a reasonable idea of where our equipment is physically located, uh, that'll be important if we need to move things around uh, in, um, in an emergency again. Um, clear communication, everyone talks about it all the time anyways, um, and it just kind of drove the point home that communication across our system is really important. You have HICS structures that are individual hospitals who are there to incident command, right? They're commanding things. They're trying to solve the problem at their hospital. And we also have a, a corporate office that can see across all the hospitals and has, you know, good ideas for maybe we don't open up two ICUs at one hospital. Maybe we open up one and shift some patients to a different location altogether. Um, and making sure that we coordinate that communication is definitely important. Um, and virtual tools are not something to shy away from. I think we've been kind of slowly as an industry moving towards more technological solutions for things. Uh, we see AR and VR coming out as, as service options, um, offerings from some of our vendors now. Uh, we need to kind of embrace that. Microsoft Teams has been great. Um, <laughs> it makes it easier to collaborate when you have a, a strong kind of quiver of virtual weapons, if you will. And finally, I would say that uh, we're, we're learning again that AEM is a fantastic tool. A um, colleague of mine got some new um, vital signs ma machines in their system. And so when you bring in new equipment, you don't really have enough information to uh, put those things on an AEM perhaps. And so now he's got you know, 500 vital signs machines that he's trying to figure out, okay, well, now we got to do PMs on these and we're in the middle of a pandemic. So um, AEM would be a powerful way for us to make some of these decisions based on evidence before it comes down to needing to make a decision about priority. So we're fortunate that most of the things that uh, you know, are time consuming and perhaps not a great value add when it comes to planned activities, we've already got a lot of that on AEM. Um, and so I think that's why we've, we've been able to keep up with our PM so far. So, and one more thing to think about, you know, if, if we're automatically at the onset of, a, of an emergency, you're gonna say, we're gonna deprioritize a certain subset of equipment. If it's not a priority right now, do they need to be when we go back to normal, right? Like maybe that, maybe that list that we're making of things that are gonna be deferred, maybe that's where we go attack uh, some additional AEM opportunities. I think from there, we turn it over to Q&A, I believe. Yes, thank you, Matt. Uh, once again, to all of our guests, as a reminder, you can submit your questions using the question section of your control panel. We'll take the, um, some time to answer as many questions as we can with respect to the, um, the presenter's time. We'll have about 10, 15 minutes here. Um, again, we're gonna take a moment for questions to come in through the queue. It's in that Q&A. Um, icon in your control panel. Um, the first question, I'm not sure which of you guys, which Matt this might refer to, but someone says, how did you distinguish between cannot locate and COVID defer? This is Matt Dummert. I can take that one. I think I was kind of referring to some of these statuses um, a lot, but it, that's a really good question because I think um, I think you, you could have the mindset of if it's, if it's could not look, if you haven't found it throughout the month, do you, do you defer it as a COVID related deferment? Um, you, you could possibly think of it that way. I, I would say, um, if, if there have been documented efforts to locate that device, so an attempt was made to find the device and do the preventative maintenance during that month, I would consider that a could not locate if it was a situation where you weren't even able to make the attempt um, because of the COVID situation, you weren't even able to look for it, then I would consider that a COVID deferred. Um, I, I think depending on the situation, it could be could vary, but that's that's the way that I would think I would answer that. 
Thank you. Um, Matt uh, Dummer, this one I think was related to you because it came in early. Um, you mentioned creation of non-critical COVID deferred status. How did you track? I guess what items were deferred or were, were um, deemed deferred? Um, I guess, I mean, I guess the first part of that is how did we even apply that? Or what did we apply that status to? And I, I, to be completely honest and straightforward, um, like I mentioned, we hit the panic button at first. So we just basically made the determination we were going to not prioritize preventative maintenance if it was going to get in the way of us being ready for a potential surge. Um, so for those initial months, primarily from March um, and a little bit in April, it was kind of like, okay, what, do, what did we not get to? And then we went back and coded those as that deferred status. Going forward, we're a little bit more thoughtful of it, but, but looking back, that's kind of how we had to identify it. So um, now we can pull out of our... Um, our CMMS, we can look back at each month and say, say what's in that deferred COVID status. And then we can go through that process of evaluating how we're going to address each one of those. Thank you. Um, hopefully that answered the question. We got one coming in. Frank, you might be able to help with this one too. Uh, individual says, um, my understanding is that the CMS waiver is in effect until the end of July. Is that correct? If it is any insight, if it will be extended. Yeah, hi. Um, so uh, this, um, the CMS waiver, um, it, it extends to what's officially called the end of the emergency declaration. So this emergency declaration was renewed, was initially made and then it was renewed on April 26th for 90 days, which takes us to the end of July. But um, it was renewed 90 days ago. Well, it was re renewed in April based on what was understood in April. So, you know, we really can't predict what the status will be in the rest of June and, and July. Um, uh, for instance, today, um, it was announced that the number of new cases in the United States uh, yesterday was 36,000 and that that's brand new COVID-19 cases. And that number is higher than at any other day in the previous four months. So yeah, the curve was flattened and, um, but now it's uh, accelerating in other parts of the country. So as the, the country as a whole, which is what CMS takes into consideration when they make these changes, um, you know, is uh, the country as a whole is getting maybe a little worse. You know, we all know that deaths and hospitalizations lag number of new cases, um, you know, so we have yet to see. Uh, so <laughs> the short answer is it's complicated. <laughs> and, and I don't think we really can tell until, uh, uh, you know, until later in uh, June and perhaps in July when they, they'll make further announcements. Thanks, Frank. Yeah, I think things we might see things continue to change. Um, an individual asked, um, his first name is Doug, any thoughts to either Matt on sharing PM history more broadly to help smaller hospitals with AEM source data? And then there's an acronym MTBF risk scoring, et cetera. Sure, this is Matt Ledon, so I can take a stab at that one. Um, you know, we talk a lot about sharing data to make AEM a little bit easier. Uh, I think it's perfectly acceptable to share information, but I think it's important to remember that the way my health system uses equipment may be different than how yours does. So we have many hospitals and we have a lot of equipment. Um, you know, we may have our equipment in use 50% of the time. If you're to smaller hospitals, you have less equipment, your equipment may be in use 80 to 90% of the time. Um, so it's just important to remember that, you know, you need to apply the information to your own experience and decide, is this enough for me to make a decision on? Um, I know we just had a, a webinar last week or the week before um, from Matt Baratich and uh, Carol Davis-Smith about 
you know, standardizing some of our codes and our work orders. And I think if we can make some more progress on that front, it would be a lot easier for me to send my information to anyone uh, and have them understand the codes that I'm using, what they mean, um, and how they could apply that to their own experience. Hope that answered the question. Yeah, um, I, I think that's helpful. Thank you, Matt. Um, there's there's a question actually from um, Mr. Heritage popped in and, and he says the right to repair movement focuses on how some manufacturers limit access to service manuals, repair parts and training. How much of a challenge have these limits caused you during the panic, if at all? I guess that's to both Matt's. This is Matt Dummert. I can, I can partially answer that, I think. Uh, it's, a it's a really good question. Um, I would say, you know, under normal conditions, in, in my experience, you know, obviously there's been some restrictiveness in, in kind of the collaboration between some of the uh, manufacturers and, and the in-house staff and the third parties for that matter. Um, and it's, it, I'm not saying it, you know, it, trying to be overly negative about it, but, um, but it, it does occur. And, and we all know that we read, read the articles on it and whatnot. But I will say that in this particular circumstance, um, this was a very, uh, this was a very difficult situation. And, and I think between us and a lot of our vendor providers um, and, and reps, it became very, very much a personal and kind of a humanitarian connection of we need to solve this together. And I will say that uh, a lot of our OEM partners were able to provide us with probably some solutions that maybe they wouldn't have as readily in normal circumstances, such as being able to activate certain options on, on certain devices that maybe we hadn't quite um, paid for yet. And normally the vendor would come in and have to do that. Well, they, they were able to work with us and, and avoid having to come on site and, and get us up and running as quick as possible. So I, I feel like, I feel like this, this whole scenario kind of brought out the humanity a little bit in the discussion and hopefully that carries over and we, we feel that kind of partnership uh, going into the future. This is Matt Van Donsel. I've had a, I've had similar experiences as, as Matt has where, um, you know, we didn't have a super hard time getting the information we needed before the, the pandemic, but um, most of our partners have, similarly been very cooperative and helpful. Uh, if we need information, they'll find a way to get us what we need. Maybe they don't give us the keys to the kingdom, you know, but they'll, they'll work us through whatever specific uh, issue we're having. Um, and I think maybe part of that too is they want to protect their own service people, right? So <laughs> to, to put a field service technician on an airplane and have them travel from Washington, Minnesota, so they can work on our anesthesia machine, um, you know, maybe that's not something that they want to do either. So I too hope that um, we'll be able to keep this momentum going um, as collaborators uh, as we go past uh, the pandemic. I agree. I, I think that's why our company, PartSource, keeps trying to provide, you know, platforms for, for you guys to share information as well. Um, another question came in from um, Amber. It says, when the state of emergency is eventually ended, how long do you anticipate it will take to catch up and bring all equipment back in compliance? Is there concern that you may be at regulatory risk if you cannot come in compliance quickly enough? So th this is Frank Painter. Let me just start this conversation. I, I, I was, um, uh, something that Matt Van Donzel said uh, really helped me with this question. He said that when, you know, that, well, I guess from something that he said, it made me think that the best thing to do is to uh, make sure that what you're doing when the, when the uh, emergency ends is that you get everything that's scheduled in the, you know, each month after that done completely. And then if you have time left over to work on other things, that way you'll be in compliance from that point on um, and, and, and then struggling to catch up. Perhaps Matt or Matt may want to add a little bit more to that. Uh, 
Yeah, this is Matt Dummer. Yeah, that's that was kind of our approach. I mean, I, we are fortunate that I, I don't, I think within a, a month or maybe a couple months, I mean, we'll see as it plays out. I feel like we can catch up. We'll be okay. Um, but I think the, the, the thought in the back of our minds is our, we're, we're maybe not done with this yet. Um, this, this may, we may surge again, or we may surge in the fall. And so we might have to deal with this all over again, but I, I think we're pretty fortunate that I, I feel like we can catch up, but I, to the, to the question, I think it'll probably take us a couple months to do that. Yeah. And this is Matt Van Donsel. I think the longer that we deal with the, with the virus, the longer it will take us to catch up. I mean, right now we have nothing to catch up on because we've been super lucky to be able to keep our plant maintenance going. Um, but we will start to run into problems getting parts uh, and getting service eventually. So the longer, the longer it lasts, the longer it will take to kind of dig back out, I think. Um, and when I, when I think about making a, a policy to kind of explain our get back on the right track plan, I would really hesitate to put a specific date to it. Unless someone like CMS comes and says, thou shalt complete your back PMs within six months, I would, I'd be hesitant uh, to put a, a time frame on it outside of we'll, we'll finish everything as soon as we can. Obviously, we'll keep, keep up with what's happening right now um, and we'll work through everything else. And we don't know how supply chains will be impacted long term from this. So to say that we'll complete all of our PMs within six months, if we can't get filters for eight months, suddenly we've made ourselves non-compliant with our own policy. I think that's uh, an interesting thing to keep in mind too. There's another question that ties into that from Christina. It says, uh, and, and Frank, you might know this with specifics to the waiver. It says, when CMS waiver expires, when do deferred PMs need to be completed by? And from our last session, I don't remember that there was a date, but you might be able to speak to that. Yeah, I, I don't think there is a date. Um, I, I think that really what you're going to be judged on is um, your, you know, when the when the emergency ends, what is your performance? You know, what what plan did you have in place before the emergency started, and um, are you able to uh, keep that, uh, you know, continue in compliance with your original plan once the emergency ends? Um, is really going to need to be your primary focus. I mean, this is this question sort of ties into the previous question. Um, there, there's no declared amount of time, you know, and, and yeah, I think I'll just leave it at that. Great. Thank you guys um, for all your answers uh, today. Out of just respect for everyone's uh, time, we are right close to the top of the hour. So um, again, I would like to thank both Matt Dummert and Matt Vendonzel for sharing their experiences with us today. I'd like to thank Frank and Mara for hosting and to all the attendees for sharing your time with us today. As a reminder, you will receive a follow-up email that will include a link to the presentation recording. It may take up to two to three business days to receive that email. It will be sent to the email address with which you registered. And at this time, the webcast has ended. Thank you all for joining and have a wonderful day.